All right, if everyone could, if everyone get to their seats, we're going to get started here. Again, it's great to have you all here tonight. As I mentioned, uh, Pastor Dan's not able to be with us here tonight. Just keep him in your prayers. His plans are to be back here with us on Sunday. And just want to share a few announcements with you as well, too. Uh, August the 13th, Sunday, uh, Sunday, August the 13th, Steve Wilburn from Core Church in L.A. will be sharing at all three services here at Calvary Chapel, Ellicott City. And, uh, you know, his, his Core Church is in the heart of Los Angeles, and he really has a heart for the, for the gospel. Um, we hear him locally on 97.5 at 4 p.m., uh, so I really would suggest, uh, you know, to come and hear him uh, on, on Sunday the 13th. He's a very energetic speaker, but he also has a heart for the gospel. So if you have unsaved friends or loved ones that you really think would uh, benefit from hearing a, a good dose of the gospel, bring them out here as well. And again, um, he's, just, uh, he's just a wonderful uh, brother in the Lord, so look forward to that. Also, this next Sunday, uh, we have our church picnic. Who's excited about the church picnic? All right, good. Paul and Will are excited. They raised their hands and said they're excited, so that's good. Um, so it'll be from 2 to 5 p.m. Just want to give you a few reminders for that. So that means it'll be after third service. We are praying for no scattered thunderstorms and showers, so please pray along with us for that. But we'll have uh, plenty of uh, tent space and canopies outside to sit under. Uh, but I'm gonna, we're going to request that you bring your own chair. We talk Sunday. If you can, put your name on it so that way someone doesn't run off with your chair by accident. And uh, just a reminder, for those who have signed up to help with the picnic, we're going to have a quick meeting after the service here tonight. So just go through some logistics in, uh, in preparation for Sunday. And if you would like to help and you haven't signed up yet, you can go ahead. You can stay after service uh, for that. And again, just some of the areas we'll need help uh, will just be uh, for setup, for cleanup, and then also with, uh, with the food as well, too, for that. So we'll go on ahead. Uh, if you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Romans, chapter 5, and... If you'd stand with me, we'll start reading in verse 12, Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. And if you're having problems finding it, have your neighbor help you. And in Romans 5 verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. For unto the law was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of one man also, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like which came through the one who sinned, for judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift Came, with many, came from many offenses and resulted in justification. For if one man's offense, death reigned through one, much more those who have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Therefore, as one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, one man's righteousness acts, the, acts as the free gift that came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many were made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus, again, we're just thankful for this time that we can just spend time in your word again this evening. We're thankful for the book of Romans and just how we learn so much about our salvation through that, how the Apostle Paul penned uh, so many great truths in the Scripture about uh, how Christ, uh, well, how, how man has a sin problem, how Christ's blood, uh, when he died on the cross for our sins and shed it for us, uh, atones or, or uh, pays the price for that, for that sin and just how we can live in our, victorious, in our lives victoriously through Christ in you, Lord. Again, I just pray that as we're here tonight that your spirit uh, will... Uh, just come down, Lord, that your word will go forth in power and work in our hearts and lives. Again, we just thank you for this night. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, it, it's always a challenge, uh, you know, when you, when you come around and, 
you know, Dan, Dan says it's always hard, too, to do a, a different message. Maybe you do a, a, like the messages we were doing uh, last week, even during the, uh, the youth conference. There's just something about being able to go chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And I'd say it was a lot of prayer uh, in what I was going to share in uh, this week and with you guys. And uh, I, I hope that's a blessing to you as look at the Word of God together. And, you know, one thing I was thinking about was just the fellowship that we have here at Calvary Chapel, Ellicott City. And I was thinking about the, the faces and the names that we have here. And I was thinking about, man, how many of you would I actually know if Jesus wasn't the common denominator? And I came up with about two. And you're going to laugh at this, but uh, at, at my job, Joel Freeman actually came and taught a course on servant leadership at, at my company. So I would have known Joel Freeman. And uh, there's another friend of mine here. His name's uh, Chris, Chris, who I met actually in the second grade, so otherwise I wouldn't know any of you guys. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about just what, what do we center on uh, here at Calvary Chapel, Ellicott like City, and just thought of a few verses before we get into the text. But really, again, uh, as we look specifically here at Romans chapter 5 tonight, it's about the salvation that we enjoy and our sins being free we enjoy through Jesus Christ. So turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, and it says there, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. And, you know, we, we here at Calvary Chapel, uh, Ellicott City, we, we stand firm on the Word of God, the apostles' teachings, what the, what the Word of God says for us. And I know that we like to break bread. We did that right before here. I know uh, last week was a, was a very, very busy week with the VBS and the youth conference we had in the evening, but just that fellowship time that we have together, praying for one another and also being in the Word together. Uh, and, and one other verse, too, just about the fellowship that we have, if you'll turn with me to 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1. I love hearing those pages turn, it's great, or I guess the screens click, whatever, whatever your, wherever your Bible is. But 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, it reads, that, that's, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we know that uh, we enjoy this, uh, the fellowship in the Word, the fellowship through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And you know, really, it's the blood of Christ that, that binds us uh, together, and our oneness is in that salvation. So that, that's really what I was thinking about, and it's really where the Lord uh, led me this evening in the book of Romans. And Unfortunately, I can't go through the first four chapters with you guys here this evening. We'd be here a very long time. We need a, several weeks for that. But uh, just a, a quick summary. So Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul talks about how uh, that Jesus Christ and his shed blood, the salvation we have is the power of God to everyone that believes. We know that uh, even uh, as we continue in the book of Romans in chapter 2 and verse 11, it says that God does not show favoritism. So in other words, he loves each and every one of us the same. We're each specially created. I know we talked a lot about that uh, last week, uh, specifically during the, with, with the youth in, in, in the evenings. But we have this problem, this sin problem, and uh, we know that that's traced back to Adam. We'll be talking about that uh, quite a bit tonight. But we know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but yet we're redeemed through Christ. Another truth we see in Romans chapter 3. And then in Romans chapter 4, we see that Abraham was a man of faith, that he uh, was declared righteous by his faith, that he, that he heard from the Lord and, and obeyed him. And even though he wasn't perfect, that his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. And then we get into where we are tonight with our text. Romans chapter 5, it starts off with, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, we're declared righteous. And it's nothing that we've done on our own, but it's through Jesus. And... Uh, you know, with that, you know, uh, focusing on down in chapter uh, 5, verses 12 to 21 tonight, we're going to look at two different men that impacted human history forever and ever, from the beginning of the world uh, e even up till now. And when you think of people who have impacted the world, I'm sure we come up with many names. Like tonight, I'm very thankful for Thomas Edison so we can have lights, a microphone, and air conditioning, right? I'm very thankful. He changed the world. We wouldn't have many things that we have today. Think of all of the things that are dependent on electricity. Cell phones, you know, uh, 
heat, light, all, all those different things, our homes that we have. Or maybe you think of Aristotle, for you philosophers in here, maybe a great warrior like Alexander the Great who changed the world. But you know what? They, they've passed on. And though they've impacted us, it doesn't come close to the impact that two men have had in, in human history. The first one is Adam. Adam was the first man God created him. And we know that Adam also is credited with original sin, which is not the, the greatest thing to be known for, even though he was, uh, he was very intelligent. He named all the animals during creation, and he brought a lot of glory to God through that. But we know that Adam wasn't brought, brought sin into the world. And then we're also going to look at another person who was a man born of a virgin. We know Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we know that Jesus, he was born perfect. He never had any sin. He never did any sin in his life. And that's why uh, we're able to have our salvation through him, through his blood that he shed on the cross for our sins, raising on the third day, conquering sin and death and hell for us. And I think tonight as we look at this passage, I'm a, I'm a big picture person. And I think it's important we look at some of these themes that we see here. We're going to talk about life. We're going to talk about death. We're going to talk about the law. We're going to talk about grace. We're going to talk about obedience. And another subject which I know that we're all very familiar in here with, disobedience. <laughs> Is that funny? Yeah. Those of you who have children can laugh. Yeah. And then also wickedness and justification. So just uh, keep these words in mind as, as we go through, and we'll look at these, uh, these dichotomies here. The other thing, too, that I think is important to keep in mind, sometimes we are very, very harsh on Adam. Man, Adam, if you wouldn't have messed up, we'd still be in the Garden of Eden right now, and life would be great. But yet, if we were still in the guard, we wouldn't have the blessings that we have through Jesus Christ, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those uh, as, as well this evening. So, again, uh, we'll go on ahead and delve into the text here. If you'll go with me to Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 12, and it says there again, Therefore, as one, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and death passed or spread upon all men for all of sin. And verse 13 says, for the law of sin was in the world, but, it was, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had, not, who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. And, you know, we, we look here and we know even in the Old Testament, so many people, when you start talking about creation, you talk about God making the world in six days and resting on the seventh, the literal creation, they're like, man, what planet are you from? I'm like, I'm from Earth. You know, God made it. I'm, I'm here. And there's so many different things we can see in creation that God's hand was on it, and he, 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 he made each and every one of us. And we know that even Jesus himself, uh, we actually read the portion this Sunday, that, uh, that Jesus himself said and believed in a literal creation. Of course, he, he was there. And he even talks about Adam and Eve, We'll go back there just because it's a good verse. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19. We're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight just because I think it's great. I like to hear pages turn too. That way I, can, I know you guys are paying attention. But it says in Matthew 19 verse 4, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Have you not read? He who made them in the beginning made them male and female, talking about Adam and Eve. And said, For this reason a man... Uh, shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And if Jesus said it, it's got to be true. I, I, I like the way Pastor Dan put it, uh, and he said it several weeks in a row. You know, if you've got a problem with what I read there, you've got a problem with the Bible and with Jesus, right? You can't, you don't have a problem with me. But, you know, as we look at Adam and and where he was, and where sin came from, it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. And if you'll turn me to the book of Genesis chapter 3, and we see Adam is in the garden. And 
as we look at verse 15, I'm sorry, uh, well, it, the man, uh, God put Adam in the garden to keep it. And we see back in, uh, in, in chapter 3, it talks about uh, with, with Adam as, as he's there and, uh, and he's with Eve. In verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And of course, as we, we won't read through the whole account there, but we know that Eve says, Of course we can eat from every tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And... You know, as, uh, as God put Adam in the garden to, to keep it, uh, he was commanded, and I apologize, but it was, it was chapter 2, not chapter 3, but it says uh, in chapter 2, verse 15 of Genesis, it said, the Lord, put, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and told him to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you surely should not eat. For in, the, in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And God told them what the consequence was going to be if they didn't listen to his commands. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we all know it, but it's just like it's, it's, in, our, it's in our nature. It's in our DNA when it comes to, to sin. If there is a sign that says, do not touch, what do we do? We touch it. If there's a wet paint sign, what does everybody want to do? Ooh, is it dry? Is it dry? And, you know, I remember I was, uh, I was probably about seven, eight years old, and uh, I don't know if people still do this, but my dad was really big into coating his driveway with that top sealer. You guys still do that? The, the tar, that thin layer of tar? And so my dad, he was very religious about covering it, and when he would do that, he would make sure to put strings and bars and signs, you know, do not step, do not walk. And uh, we had a neighbor lived across the street. And he was determined to come up, and he wanted to play with us. Well, I don't know why, but I looked at our door because our doorbell rang, and there he is standing with a big smile on his face in front of us. All the broom handles and everything, the buckets are moved out of the way. You could see steps all over the driveway. I look at my friend, and he has tar from his top all the way to his bottom. His shoes, which were white, were tarred and feathered. It was, it was awful. And, and to make things worse, this is his like, new outfit he was supposed to wear for school like that next week when we were starting school. And you know, I, I look back at that and I just think, man, like, why did he do that? Like, I was even thinking at seven years, like, why did you like, go through all that? But he just was bent on doing what he wanted to do. And as soon as Adam and Eve broke God's rule, as soon as they went forward and they decided, you know what, we're going to do what we want to do. It says in uh, Genesis chapter 3, we'll go down a little bit further here. In Genesis 3 verse 4, it says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, wow, I want to be like God. Was this her place? No, it wasn't. It says, so the woman saw the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took the fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband there, and he ate. Then both their eyes were open, they knew they were both naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. So you look at this, and we're not going to go through here and, and point fingers, but Adam and Eve, they both disobeyed what God said. And there was consequences there for, for both of them. And it says even they knew that they were naked. They knew they had, they had the knowledge that they were naked. And it says they put fig leaf coverings together. Now, how many of you guys ever tried putting fig leaf coverings on? Please don't do it, okay? I, I, I've never tried it before, but figs can be very sharp on the edges and they can also be rather rough, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it. But God shows up in the garden, and they're wearing fig leaves. And we see uh, further down, it says, uh, 
verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord among the garden. I can just imagine what the soundtrack to that movie would be like. Dun, 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 you know. They knew they were in trouble. And they hid. And the Lord called out to Adam in verse 9. It says, it said to him, he says, where are you? Do you think God knew where Adam and Eve were? It's not like that took God by surprise that they were high, didn't know where they were. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God and Adam have this conversation. Well, Adam, who told you that you were naked? Who? And we go through all the way, and we see that they admit to God that they've sinned. And in verse 13, I'm, I'm sorry, verse, verse 12, it says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I command you that you should not eat? And the man said, oh, here we go, the first blame in history, the woman you gave me. Yeah. Adam had a choice in this, but he says, the, the woman whom you gave me, gave, gave to be with me, she gave me the, of the tree and I ate. And God even asked Eve then, what is this that you have done? And she says, well, the serpent deceived me. Oh, man, so it's kind of like going down, down the hill from here. But God pronounces judgment on each of those that are involved in this sin, on the, on the serpent, on, on Eve, and, and on Adam as well. But th there is a big difference, uh, you know, here that we see, is that in this situation, Eve she did sin, but there was some intentionality in what Adam did. He had a transgression. And he transgressed God because he knew what Eve did was wrong, but yet he decided to go along with it anyways. And we know that uh, it came to the point, even this early on in Scripture, God gave the example, as it says in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And so God clothed Adam and Eve through the death of, of an animal and clothe them in skins. And from here on out, we know that sin is going to be a part of man's life, men, men and women, mankind. And Adam's going to be the focus of this passage uh, here as we go back to Romans chapter 5, because Adam was the one who was created, but yet he also transgressed. And it says, uh, therefore, through one man sin entered the world, that one man being Adam. And, you know, Adam lost uh, the human race and, and handed over the human race in, in original sin to, to Satan. And it says in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 3, it says, uh, you know, many times we look at and even share about this with others, and people are blinded to it. It says uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, it says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But we can pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that people's eyes will be open to, to the gospel. And we see Satan blinds in this day and age. We see he's done it all the way even back in the garden. That he is the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air. And Adam brought in sin, and he also brought in death. And death was not something that Adam really was aware of until God told him what the consequence of the sin was going to be if, if, he, if he committed this transgression against him. But we know today that in the world, a person dies every two seconds. And what I can tell you about everybody in this room is that everybody was born and everybody is going to die. And uh, as, we, as we look at this, it's just amazing to me, but you know, we, we try and avoid death. And I think it's good to be healthy to, you know, but people take vitamins, they take supplements, they inject serums in their bodies so they can look young, but, but they're all going to die. And I, I look at this and I really say, it's like, you know, people talk about cancel culture today, and 
I think Satan started cancel culture way back in Genesis chapter 3 when he gave that, when he gave that lie. And when we talk about sin, sin is simply just to miss the mark. I don't know if we have any archers in here, but this is a, that's what this is a picture of, the idea of archery, to be able to totally miss the target. And with Adam missing the mark in sin, that had an impact to every single one of us. And there's another well-known verse in Romans chapter 6 that says the wages of sin is death. It doesn't say the wages of sin are death because that wage of sin is death. That goes all the way back to Adam with that first sin in the garden. And as we see Adam and Eve in this transgression, we see Adam with death being passed upon all men uh, through him, that it really changed the world. We're clothed here because of what happened in the Garden of Eden today. And you look at the different things in the world that are going on now, sickness, death, you know, the suffering that goes on, wars, rumors of wars, all the different things. It's, it's because of, of sin. And we should, you know, think about that. It's like, man, Todd, you're being really depressing tonight. Yeah. What are we, we going to do? And we really have to look at the grace that we have through Jesus Christ. We'll, we'll get to that shortly here. I won't, I won't leave you guys in the, in the realm of sin. But even, even David in the Psalms, he said that I was brought forth in iniquity and sin my mother conceived me. And, you know, every child that's born is born with, it, with a sin nature. And isn't it amazing that you don't have to teach any child to do things wrong. There's this magical two-letter word that comes out even when they're less than one years old. One year old. No. How many of you guys have heard that? No. I want you to come with me right now. No. Eat your peas. No. Hold my hand. No. Or the other one that comes out, and this is a favorite one in my household, is I'll do it myself. Right? Wow. Um, you know, because babies, they're not like they're, you know, robbing banks or breaking commandments in the womb, right? I mean, it's just, it's just not happening. They're in utero there. God is creating them and knitting them together, but yet they're born uh, into sin. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And we'll hear the hope in, about of Christ here. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So, you know, what, what does this say about us today? You know, wh one thing that I, I didn't know, but as I was studying this passage, I hadn't come across it before, but it says here in verse 12, it says, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. And this idea of spreading, like, it's not like a fertilizer spreader where you kind of, you know, push around, it sprays all over the place or it's through contact. It actually means that it's passed through or pierced through. So when it says here, when the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, when he said death spread to all men, it means it's at the core of every single person, every single, every single one that's born, it's passed. And there's no way to get around it. No one's immune to it, right, because everybody dies. There's no vaccine for it. We'd like to have a vaccine for everything as well, too. You can't you can't get rid of original sin with a vaccine. You can't skip out on death. As we said earlier, death impacts uh, the infant, young, middle-aged, and old. It impacts, it impacts all mankind. And I look in contrast to this, that the perfect son of God, Jesus, had to be pierced and shed his blood so our sins could be forgiven as well. So, Todd, tell me something positive here. Let's, let's, uh, let's lift this up a little bit. You know, the blessing that we have is what we see in Jesus Christ. And as we uh, go down a little bit further here to verse 15 in Romans chapter 5, it says, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, 
much more the grace of God and the gift by grace as a by one man Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. It's a blessing to go from verse 14 to verse 15. It gives us hope. It has the opposite effect. We know that our eternity through Jesus Christ, our salvation, our deliverance from sin is 100% effective through the blood that he shed on the cross for our sins. And we'll see here this word used over and over again, much more. You think about when you say there's much more, there's much more over here. I'm not going to say, say this, but I was talking with uh, one, of the, one of the youth here, and they said, oh, that's much more bigger over there. They were talking about, you know, something. I was like, oh, boy, yeah. But you could say that, you know, Jesus, you could say he's much more bigger than our sin. Excuse my poor English there. I'm sure the English teachers are cringing as I say that now. But it also talks about the fact that we abound in Christ. It means in excess. You see, you think about it with Jesus Jesus is not just a mere religious leader, someone who just kind of popped up on the map and was here for a little while and, and moved on. You can't really place Jesus in the same platform as, as others like Gandhi or Buddha or Muhammad or any other religious leader because he's 100% unique. Jesus didn't create a religion. He's the only one that can rightfully claim, I am the only way to God. In John 14, 6, he said to his disciples, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. And I'd like to have you guys turn to a verse in John chapter 11. And uh, again, the words of Christ, another one of the great I am's that, that he used when he spoke when he was among men. We know that Lazarus was, uh, was dead. I'd like in the... Uh, King James, it said, don't open the tomb before he stinketh. I think stinketh is a cool word. But Jesus, Jesus said to them, it says in uh, John 11, verse uh, 35, I'm sorry, I have the wrong verse here. But, uh, but he, he says in, in, uh, in John chapter 11, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in chapter 12 here, and I wonder why I have the wrong verse, man. So in John eleven twenty five 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whosoever believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So Jesus was coming to let people know that he was here to change and to remove sin. And Believing in him, asking Jesus to forgive us of our sins, is the only way that we can have true life, is the only way that we can live and never die. So Jesus, not only was he perfect, but he, he's our Savior as well. And looking a little further here, back in Romans chapter 5, in verse 16, the gift is incredible because the free gift that we get of our deliverance from our sin, to have our sins forgiven, is very different than the way that Adam brought sin into the world. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for that. He shed his blood on the cross. And there's a, there's a great passage in the book of Colossians chapter 2. And it says there in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, and you, so this is speaking to the church at Colossae, but it's, it's, it can also be taken each every one of us. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he made alive together with him, having forgiven you of all your trespasses, right? We said that Adam was the one that trespassed against God, taking an additional level. Having wiped the handwriting of the requirements or the laws that were against us, which was contrary to us, 
having taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. We were talking earlier about how Jesus was pierced for our transgressions, how our sins were, were conquered. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, making a public, public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So we know that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice uh, for us there with that. And we have an abundance of grace um, through, through Jesus. And we must remember that our eternity is secure through Christ, but yet we also have a lifelong opportunity to live at peace with God and share this message uh, with others about Jesus. We can walk in the comfort of knowing that our future is secure through Jesus. And as we continue uh, down in the passage, in verse 18 it says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteousness, I'm sorry, one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. As we look at these verses here, especially in verse 18, it says, therefore, as one man's offense came to all men, that offense was Adam, that original sin. And it's just reiterated several times in this passage that that resulted through the sin, the original sin in the garden. But through that one man, the first all is in Adam, but the second we see here is in Jesus Christ. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that man being Jesus, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification. And justification is a big word for just saying that you're being declared righteous. And we know without the shed blood of Christ, there's no way, no other way that that could be done. And I was thinking of a, another verse uh, back in the book of John, if you turn me to the book of John, chapter 1. And in, in John chapter 1, we get a picture of the change or what Jesus did when he came into this world. And it says in John chapter 1, verse 16, it says, And his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. I like that, grace for grace, right? The grace just keeps on coming, gets piled on. Verse 17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to ask you guys to raise hands, but would you rather be under the law or under grace and truth through Jesus Christ? You see, Adam and Jesus had one thing in common. They were both created without sin. But Adam made a choice. And what we lost in Adam, Christ built or fixed that relationship with God through his shed blood on the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, For if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation, a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And... You know, you think about it, many people, as, we, as you talk with people at work or, or wherever, people talk about, man, the world's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And you know why that is? Because there's more and more and more sinners in the world. And we know, based upon the Scripture, that things are going to continue to get worse as, as men has their hearts set against God. But we also need to remember that we're not of this world that our citizenship is of heaven, and we should be looking to what we can do to glorify God in this, in this life. Turn me a few pages to the uh, Romans chapter 12. And this verse is always a, a challenge to me, just thinking about our walk with the Lord for those of us who have put our faith and trust as Jesus as our Savior. And Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So as we walk with the Lord, it's, it's, a, it's a command that we are willing to serve Him, even be a living sacrifice for Him, be acceptable to God. And verse 2 talks about the world, and be not conformed to this world, or this world, that, that, that word world there means, talks about this world system, sin, the evilness of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And this reasonable service that we do is our mind is transformed, as it's renewed as we're in the Scriptures. It allows those who don't know Christ as their Savior to see something different in us. It allows us to be able to share the gospel with them because we all can be made new through Jesus. And uh, I was thinking of the, in the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 21, Jesus himself says, he says, behold, I'm making all things new, a new heavens and a new, new earth there. But we're being made new day by day. We're being renewed in our mind as we walk with him. Verse 19 continues by saying, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. And you think about the one act that Adam had that made all men sinners. But yet we too can have a part in sharing the gospel with others so they too can become righteous and, and come to know Jesus as their Savior. You know, I, I was thinking about uh, Nicodemus and just how his mind must have been blown away when he met with Jesus and, and spoke with him in, in John chapter 3. And you don't have to turn there with me, but uh, we'll just look at a few, a few verses there. But in, in John chapter 3, uh, a very well-known verse that, that's there, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I, I want to look at the verses that are around that. And it ties very well in to what we've been talking about with the law showing sin and the grace that we have through Jesus Christ. In verse 14, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, how many of you have noticed that verse 15 is a complete repeat of what's in, the, in verse 16? Usually when something's put there twice, it's important. You might want to underline that in there. Verse 15, again, I'll read it again. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I'm sure that blew Nicodemus' mind when Jesus was sharing that with him. The fact that Jesus had come to save the world. And we know that uh, our justification in Christ allows us to stand firm on his sacrifice. There's three words that Jesus Christ said at the cross, and I'm sure you all say it with me. It is finished. That is what we stand on when he conquered sin and death and hell on the cross, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And it's just a wonderful blessing that we have uh, through, through Jesus. So through one man, all were made sinners, but through one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So that takes us to our last uh, two verses uh, tonight. Romans chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Wow. The law entered that offense might abound. The reason why God put the law in place was to show man that he was sinful. And, you know, we, we, we look out there, we have a lot of laws in the land here. And... Some of them govern how we interact with each other, how we meet uh, certain rights that we have. Some govern how fast we should be driving on the road. I know uh, the thing is, though, with each of those laws, we're all offenders, right? We've all broken at least one of those laws. And even God, 
put the law of the Ten Commandments together. We could go through those and talk about the different Ten Commandments, of the Ten Commandments that we've broken. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen something? Have you ever not honored your father and mother? But that law entered that we could see our need to have our relationship fixed with God. And it says, uh, in the second part of verse 20, it says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And, you know, I, I remember, uh, and this was a long time ago, I'll, I'll tell you a little story um, about something that happened to me. And many of you may be at this state of your life now. Many of you, it may be something close uh, that, that just happened, but you know, we, we grade things that are of value. We grade comic books, baseball cards, football cards, cars, homes. But one thing that's always important that's graded in value is when you get married is that wedding ring. And I remember when I was buying Michelle our wedding ring, or her wedding ring, her engagement ring, and I was learning all about that, you know, cut clarity, color, and carrot, right, the four C's. You guys write those down, okay? One day if the Lord has you get married, all right? But, you know, you can really see the difference, you know, and the salesman's there, and they're showing me all these different rings and everything. I'm like, oh, well, this one, you know, is, is not as clear, and you can see it. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, of course, and then that one costs like 20 times as much as that one. I'm like, okay, what can I afford? But there was a big difference in what I wanted. I want to get the perfect wedding ring for Michelle, but I couldn't afford perfection. We you know, in our, in our lives, that law as a standard, we, we can't attain perfection. But, you know, I, I wanted to buy Michelle and give her the best that I could afford, but yet it, it still wasn't perfect. And we, we just have to know we cannot be and attain the perfection, that, the standard that God has in and of our own. It has to be through, through Jesus. Anything that we offer God is going to be substandard. And with our sins separating us from God, the law shows our sin and transgression. But I'm glad that the verse didn't end there because it says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. And that, it says abounded much more there, that means it's like the word superabounded. So you could take like a red Superman S and put it on abound. It, it, it just overwhelmed. But it causes us to see the law uh, and its purpose and how grace covers a multitude of sin. There, there's a hymn uh, called Wonderful Grace of Jesus, and I'm going to sing it for you this evening. Oh, I'm just kidding, totally. Um, a man named Haldor Lelanus wrote it in 1918, and I'm definitely not going to sing it, but I'd like to read you just the first verse and the... And the uh, and the chorus, it says, Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. It reaches all of us. And the chorus reads, Wonderful matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. O oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. And as we look at that, it just, uh, just very eloquently puts together the depth and the height of the grace that Jesus has given us. None of us have ever swum to the bottom of the sea. None of us have been to all the highest mountains in the world, but it covers even more than, than that. It covers our sin. And so that grace abounded so much more. And finally, in verse 21, it says, So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if it weren't for Jesus, our lives would still be reigned in death. We'd be stuck in sin. And Many would ask the question, well then, why in the world did God allow sin to enter the world? And one answer that, 
that I came up with is because God has received more glory and man more blessings through Christ's sacrifice than if sin had never entered. You know, if we had continued in the Garden of Eden, we would just not have experienced the redemptive work of Christ. We wouldn't be co-heirs with Christ and receive those, those blessings. So tonight, as we're here, we can rejoice in the work of Christ at Calvary. That we have our eternal life, as it says in verse 21, through Jesus Christ our Lord, through righteousness to eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And I'd like to challenge each and every one of you here tonight. You know, there could be someone in here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Are you still carrying that burden of sin? Are you struggling to find peace? Tonight could be the night of your salvation. Definitely like to talk to you about that if you have any questions afterwards, just to pray with you and just to share some, some scriptures with you. But I think it's also a challenge to each and every one of us that know Jesus as their Savior. There is a world out there that needs to hear the gospel so much. Uh, as we look in Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God, it always talks about shoes on your feet, having put to readiness, being given the gospel of peace. We have a wonderful message that we can share with this world around us. God's forgiveness is there as a free gift. And I'd like to encourage you, we should never forget the wonder of it all, the wonder that we have through Jesus. Never take it for granted. The good news of the gospel is for the sinner, but it's also for those who are saved who know Jesus as their Savior. It brings deliverance and gives us hope in our walk with Jesus day by day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, again, we're just so thankful for this night and how we could just look into your word and uh, just see the, the truth of how our sins separated us from you, but yet through grace and through Christ Jesus that we can have our sins forgiven. And Lord, it is my prayer tonight that if there is even one here who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that tonight could be the night of their salvation. And Lord, we also just pray too, uh, as a challenge for each and every one of us here as well, that we will be willing to share this message of the gospel in our schools, Lord, in our communities, in our work, uh, Lord, wherever you would have us be. And again, help us to take a stand for you in these last days. We just thank you and praise you for what you've done and what you're doing in your name, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great evening.